Good morning, everyone. I'm Caitlin Roshan, Manager of Corporate Initiatives for Durham Region. I welcome you to our session today, Empowering the Community, Durham's Nuclear Sector Strategy. Before we get started, please note, the session will be recorded and posted to Durham Region's YouTube channel following the event. To turn on live captions, click on the three dots, more actions near the top of your screen and select turn on live captions. To ask questions during the panel discussion, you can put them directly into the Q&A. Today, we're celebrating the adoption of Durham Region's nuclear sector strategy, a 10-year plan that will equip us to seize opportunities and take actions to support a prosperous and sustainable community. While participants are joining this session remotely from various locations, I would like to begin by acknowledging that Durham Region is located on lands that have long served as a site of meeting and exchange among the Mississauga peoples and is the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Alderville First Nation, Hiawatha First Nation, Curve Lake First Nation, and the Chippewa Nations of Georgina Island, Beausoleil, and Rama. Our collective history shows that policies and strategies can be used to strengthen communities or to erode and eradicate their rights. We continue to work toward rebuilding and repairing our relationship with First Nations, as well as the large Métis community here in Durham and the growing Inuit community. We continue to learn and recognize that more work is needed from the region of Durham and all levels of government to reconcile the intergenerational trauma of Indigenous peoples and to continue our work towards culturally safe organization. We are committed to addressing and playing our part in responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada calls to action. We honor, recognize, respect Indigenous peoples as rights holders and stewards of the lands and waters on which we have the privilege to live and meet today. We are thankful for their stewardship and teachings about our earth and our relationship with it. May we honor those teachings through our interactions today and every day. With this nuclear sector strategy, we seek to learn and create a dialogue and build opportunities for collaboration through government to government relationship. We have an exciting panel plan this morning, facilitated by our Director of Economic Development and Tourism, Simon Gill, where we'll learn more about some of the projects that are getting underway locally. And later, we'll hear from Dr. Daniel Hornwig, Associate Dean and Professor of Ontario Tech University's Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science and Chair of the Durham Region Roundtable on Climate Change. Dan will discuss the role of communities like Durham on the path to net zero emissions and the role of nuclear in helping us meet our climate change targets. But before we begin, I'd like to share some welcome messages. Hello and welcome. I'm John Henry, Chair and CEO of Durham Region. I'm pleased to welcome you to this Durham Nuclear Sector Strategy Session. Nuclear energy has always been a vital part of Durham's story. The strategy illustrates many of the reasons why we continue to be excited. The nuclear sector employs thousands of skilled people both directly in its facilities and organizations and indirectly in the supply chain. Durham is a leader in nuclear innovation with a strong cluster of nuclear energy supporting organizations and institutions, such as the Ontario Tech University, which has the only accredited nuclear engineering undergraduate program in Canada, the Center for Small Modular Reactors, or SMRs, which is helping lead research on advanced nuclear power technology and new applications of nuclear energy. The Canadian Center for Nuclear Sustainability in Pickering, which is developing innovations for decommissioning, waste stewardship, and site repurposing. Plus, there's groundbreaking work being done locally by our partners at OPG. Our nuclear infrastructure is world class, and we're going to be adding to that infrastructure with Canada's first SMR at Darlington. Plus, nuclear energy is emissions free. This will not only help Durham become a net zero community by 2050, but it also will lead to more investment in jobs as the world pursues clean energy alternatives and turns its focus towards nuclear. So yes, there's a lot to be excited about. I wanna thank the team and all the contributors for the great job they did in developing this forward thinking and community-based strategy. It offers clear opportunities for us to shape a prosperous and sustainable future. 
The region is committed to this strategy and to ensuring we realize these opportunities. Forums like this help because they give us a chance to share information, build and nurture partnerships, offer perspectives and updates, and evaluate how we are doing. So thank you for helping write the next chapter of our nuclear story as we build an even better Durham together. Hello, I'm Dave Ryan, Mayor of the City of Pickering, and I'm pleased to welcome you as we launch the 10-year Durham Regional Nuclear Sector Strategy. As the Mayor of a nuclear host community, I'm excited for a strategy that outlines direction that creates jobs, protects our environment, strengthens our community, and encourages economic growth. The strategy also reminds me how important our nuclear industry is and the many ways it touches the everyday lives of our residents. Pickering's relationship with nuclear is well known. You know, no matter where I go in Canada, when people hear I'm from Pickering, they ask me about nuclear. So I often get the boast that our Pickering Nuclear Generating Station has served Ontarians for years, providing clean, safe, and reliable power. Pickering is a beautiful community with an impressive waterfront, four conservation areas, and a boundary with the Rouge National Park. So I'm proud, I'm very proud to tell people about our environmental commitment and how nuclear power has helped Ontario to phase out its coal burning power production. With commercial operations at Pickering Station ending, the story is changing. We're embarking on the world's largest decommissioning project, and this is leading to new opportunities. You know, the nuclear sector strategy outlines how we're well positioned to be a leader in innovation, particularly around advancements in decommissioning, sustainable solutions for nuclear waste, and site repurposing. By partnering with OPG, the Centre for Canadian Nuclear Sustainability in Pickering, the Centre for SMRs, the Ontario Tech University, and with all the supporting nuclear infrastructure and talent already in place, we will be attracting skilled jobs, establishing new and innovative businesses, and promoting economic development. In other words, Pickering is winding down operations while gearing up to be a global leader in nuclear research and innovation. It's something new that I can boast about when asked, and I hope you will too. Thank you for your time and participation, and please enjoy the event. I'm very pleased to join you today, and I do look forward to a productive and informative event. Prior to becoming mayor in 2010, I was in the financial services sector for over 25 years, so I know a thing or two about good investments. What we're launching today with the Durham Nuclear Sector Strategy is a great investment in our community, in our region, and in the province. It's one that will be paying dividends for years to come. This investment means jobs, security, and supply chain and economic growth for the region, both now and for the foreseeable future. Clarington and Durham have long led the way in clean, safe nuclear electrical production. We're going to continue building on this illustrious history with the development of a new on-grid small modular reactor or SMR, as well as undertaking refurbishments at Darlington. Because this SMR is the first for Canada, it helps position Durham as a global centre of nuclear expertise and as a leader among other nuclear host communities. The nuclear sector strategy is a blueprint to share with other Canadian municipalities. This is something I'll be helping to do in my role as the chair of the Canadian Association of Nuclear Host Communities. The production of clean, affordable energy is a global imperative. As we collectively look to thwart climate change, nuclear power will become an increasingly viable and important part of the solution. I encourage everyone, if you haven't already done so, to read through the strategy. You too will be excited by it. It describes actions that will build our capacity, encourage positive growth, and set ourselves up to effectively and proactively engage in our future. It's an investment that will continue to benefit us all. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chief Emily Weetung of Curb Lake First Nation, and it's my pleasure to bring greetings from my community. Thank you to Caitlin Roshan and Sandra Austin for this invitation to provide welcome remarks for the launch of the Durham Nuclear Sector Strategy. Thank you to Caitlin for acknowledging our treaty territory. This is a recognition of the land occupied by my ancestors and the ancestors of my sister communities. 
This treaty is what created a formal contractual relationship for my ancestors to share the land and resources with your ancestors and for you and I to share the wealth and resources today. It is the foundation for having the space for all of those gathered here today to make this Durham nuclear sector strategy inclusive and meaningful for our nation and ensure prosperity for all our relations. As Chair Henry communicated in his welcome remarks, it is also my desire that we come together for a better future. I know we will hear from other speakers today that nuclear technology is emissions free, that it has provided clean, safe, reliable power to Ontario. While we agree that it is a necessary part of the future of energy in Ontario, we view nuclear technology as temporary and transitional technology while we move towards something more sustainable. In its complete life cycle, nuclear technology is not strictly emissions free and the issue of waste remains a prominent concern for our communities, which must necessarily be dealt with by our future generations. Now is the time where we must set aside historic divisions work together inclusively and meaningfully to tackle our collective net zero carbon goals as a way to demonstrate care for the environment. More importantly, we need to ensure a sustainable ecological future and meaningful economic participation in the nuclear industry and in the Durham region. Third Lake First Nation was invited to provide input to Durham's nuclear sector strategy. We appreciate that much of our input was incorporated into the strategy. It truly shows that the region is committed to engaging with us on nuclear matters and other matters by nurturing a meaningful relationship through trust, reciprocity, and respect. The co-creating language reflected in this strategy is appreciated. It is a good step in systemic inclusion of our people in decision-making processes. Further, it is a tangible step towards truth and reconciliation. To close, I would like to offer a short prayer today a prayer of healing to this earth, for the land, for the water, for the people, and for our language. A prayer of love and respect. A prayer of enlightenment and acceptance. A prayer for peace and hope. I offer a prayer and ask the Creator to walk with us this day, to guide our steps, to allow us to feel His presence in our life, and to remind us that we walk this path together. We watch for those that have been before us and have left these gifts for us to share and to carry forward. We glitch for those left to come for giving us this responsibility to sustain the earth. We glitch to everyone at the launch today. I wish you the very best at this launch and look forward to many opportunities to work together in the future. We glitch, we glitch, we glitch, we glitch. Good morning. I'm Elaine Baxter Traher, the Chief Administrative Officer for the Region of Durham. As the region's CAO, I have the privilege of working with many of the almost 5,000 hardworking regional employees. And every day I am humbled and inspired by how everyone across the organization is passionate about their work for the region's residents. Today, I want to acknowledge and thank the members of the Nuclear Sector Working Group who developed Durham's Nuclear Sector Strategy. Not only do they have a great deal of experience and knowledge, but also because of the nuclear industry's long and strong presence in the region, they brought an inherent pride to the project. You'll see it when you read the strategy. It has been created with care, care for the region, the people who live here, our environment, our economy, our heritage, and our future. Developing this 10-year Durham Region Nuclear Sector Strategy was a big job, yet it took less than a year to do, from the project charter approval last March to council approval late last year. A key part of the project was the comprehensive external consultation process. We reached out to community through our online engagement platform. We surveyed rights holders, our partners, and interested parties to get feedback on our draft objectives and potential actions and we hosted seven focus group sessions to tap into the extensive knowledge and experience of Indigenous communities, academia, federal, provincial and municipal staff, nuclear industry representatives, and OPG in particular. The consultation process helped confirm some assumptions and identified priorities, ultimately enabling us to produce and endorse a strategy that gives us clear direction to move forward. The feedback we received was incorporated into all areas of the strategy. It particularly influenced the goals, actions, and outcomes. 
One of the main themes of the feedback we received related to communications and the importance of addressing knowledge gaps, dispelling myths, sharing information, and generating enthusiasm and pride within the community and beyond. Open communications will be a key focus of our implementation. Today's session is an example of how we can do just that. Overall, the strategy's development was a true team effort. Thank you to everyone who contributed their thoughts, perspectives, and expertise. So now that we've created the strategy, we get to implement it. There is no doubt that there will be both challenges and opportunities ahead, but I am confident that this strategy will ensure the well-being of residents, the environment, and the economy, and that we will continue this positive culture of collaboration as we continue to move forward together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Gregoris, Chief Nuclear Officer at OPG. I am honoured to welcome you to this event today, and we are pleased Durham Region continues in its commitment to make the nuclear sector a key priority through the establishment of this strategy. In OPG's Climate Change Plan, we pledge to reach net zero as a company by 2040 and to act as a catalyst to help the broader economy reach net zero by 2050. Clean nuclear power will help us achieve that goal. Our strong history of generating net zero electricity at our Pickering and Darlington stations, combined with the $12.8 billion Darlington refurbishment project, and our recent announcement to build a small modular reactor at Darlington, all reinforce Durham's place as the clean energy capital of Canada. For OPG and our employees, being a part of the community is about more than simply generating electricity. It's about being engaged community members that encourage and support local organizations and initiatives that help keep our community strong and healthy. OPG believes it's our responsibility to help out in the communities where we operate, especially during these unprecedented times. Whether it's through our ongoing operations, community events with our local partners, or continuing to innovate, grow, and improve the way we serve our communities, we are proud to call Durham Region our home. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair Henry, Mayor Ryan, Mayor Foster, Chief Weetung, Elaine baxter Traher, and Steve Gregoris for your welcome messages. Your support throughout the development of the strategy was so important and your guidance and expertise invaluable. I'm thrilled to present Empowering the Community, Durham Region's Nuclear Sector Strategy to you all today. As Elaine mentioned, a great deal of work went into developing this first-of-a-kind municipal strategy. Next slide, please. In Durham Region, nuclear energy is an important part of our story. Our community has been one of Canada's principal nuclear jurisdictions since the 1960s. With two provincially owned nuclear generating stations and a robust local supply chain, our community is a hub of nuclear academia, engineering, and manufacturing. Next slide, please. As a municipality, we have several roles within the sector. We have specific host community responsibilities, and we also have a responsibility to be accountable and responsible to our community about the things that happen here. Over the coming decade, there will be many changes. Commercial operations at Pickering will end, refurbishment at Darlington will be completed, new medical isotopes will be harvested, the recently completed facility at Port Granby will be naturalized, and Canada's first on-grid small modular reactor will be constructed here. There's a lot to be excited about. But in the past, staying informed and engaged of these leading edge projects has been a challenge for us. So from the very beginning, a key objective of ours was to build our capacity so that we can play a stronger role and engage more effectively and proactively. Next slide, please. Nuclear energy has powered life in this community for decades, so you may be wondering why now? Durham Region has declared a climate emergency and set ambitious goals to reduce our carbon emissions. Low carbon electricity from nuclear generation will be vital to reduce the use of fossil fuels in heating and transportation and to meet our net zero by 2050 goal. As well, over the next decade, key actions and decisions in the nuclear sector will be made that will affect our community for decades to come. 
The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission will hold a hearing for a facility in Durham almost every year. A new federal policy on radioactive waste and decommissioning will be released this year. With much of Canada's waste safely stored here, this policy will be significant to our community. The site of the Deep Geological Repository for used fuel will be announced in 2023, and small modular reactor development at Darlington will get underway and create immense opportunities that we don't want to miss out on. And equally, the end of commercial operations at the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, the largest decommissioning project in the world to date, will bring unique challenges and opportunities to the region. With this strategy, we'll empower our community by growing understanding of the nuclear sector, working with partners to seize opportunities, and preparing for an evolving future. Next slide, please. This strategy was developed over three often overlapping phases. Phase one was awareness. We convened a working group of regional staff who had a role in the nuclear sector. Planners, emergency managers, staff from the works, economic development, communications, finance, legal, and policy teams. We recognized the pressing need to improve the knowledge and capacity within the region to respond on nuclear matters. We knew we needed to organize staff internally to support greater collaboration and efficient and effective participation in hearings, consultations, and policy reviews, and brainstorm the ways we might achieve this. Phase two was listening. We're proud of the collaboration that was involved in developing this strategy. As Elaine mentioned, we engaged local First Nations communities, Ontario Power Generation and Canadian Nuclear Labs, local area municipalities, the federal and provincial government, the community, and other diverse organizations. We ran several focus group sessions and heard about the roles that the region should play to support the community and industry. We heard that the region's role includes educating elected officials at all levels of government, staff, and the community about the nuclear sector to better understand the opportunities and challenges and to champion shared goals and interests. We heard that education needs to be a joint effort. We heard that the region should play a convening role to support information sharing and partnership development among the many organizations in the nuclear sector using both existing forums, but also addressing gaps at the regional scale. We heard that building the region's capacity to advocate and influence decision making that affects the community was an important role, and that the region should create an economic vision focused on a cleaner, more sustainable economy. We heard that by recognizing Indigenous history, rights, and interests in economic development and environmental partnership, the region can demonstrate commitment to build opportunities for true collaboration with Indigenous communities. And finally, we heard a desire from the nuclear industry, including OPG, to partner more with the region. The next phase was integration. Feedback and lessons learned were incorporated into all areas of the strategy and particularly influenced the goals, actions, and outcomes. So now we have the strategy, but it's a starting point, not an end. We'll continue to monitor, evaluate our actions, and refine our strategy as time goes on. Next slide, please. The strategy has four goals. Grow understanding of the nuclear sector among, the region, among regional council staff in the community. Build prosperity by maximizing the benefits of being a nuclear host community and Canada's premier center of the nuclear industry and innovation. Protect and sustain the community by addressing the impacts and opportunities of being a nuclear host community. And lead and develop partnerships within the nuclear sector to build leadership capacity and influence decision making. Next slide, please. The first goal is grow understanding. We understand that the region has a role as a trusted source of balanced information. This is going to be a multi-generational effort in partnership with First Nation communities, post-secondary institutions, and the industry. This goal is important because an ongoing understanding of the sector's effect on the region is the basis of good decisions by elected officials at all levels. We have a rapidly growing community with students and many newcomers to the region who may be unfamiliar with the nuclear sector and large projects like the SMR development and federal policy changes will have long-term effects here. Key outcomes for this goal include increased understanding and knowledge transfer by council staff in the community, improved alignment and consistency among regional staff communications, and increased community engagement and participation in the nuclear sector, engagement opportunities and planning. Next slide, please. 
The Maximize Prosperity Goal focuses on how the region can support and benefit from the economic opportunities presented by anticipated new investment in Durham from SMR development, OPG's new campus, and decommissioning. We recognize that this economic activity takes place on the traditional lands of the Williams Treaty First Nations and commit to strengthening those relationships and working to preserve the lands and waters for future generations. Key outcomes for the Maximize Prosperity Goal include expanding the sector by attracting investment, research and job creation, developing a reputation as a respected, innovative source of medical isotopes and internationally as the global center of nuclear expertise, helping to develop the talent pipeline in nuclear science and all the related trades and professions that support these projects, ensuring that local manufacturing supports SMR development across Canada. Next slide, please. As a regional municipality, our role is to sustain and protect the fiscal, environmental, social, economic well-being of the region and the community with the goal of health and prosperity for all. It's a balancing act. The nuclear sector has supported high quality life in Durham, provided excellent jobs directly and through the supply chain. Major new investments, uh, projects, decommissioning and federal policy change, sorry, federal policy will create change. The sustain and protect goal aims to increase our capacity to forecast and plan for these changes, reduce uncertainty, mitigate socioeconomic effects and identify new opportunities. Outcomes include developing financial arrangements to help fund nuclear host community responsibilities, offsetting municipal and broader community socioeconomic impacts associated with the retirement of Pickering, increasing the capacity for the region to anticipate and prepare for changes related to nuclear projects in Durham and preserve and restore affected lands and waters. Next slide, please. As a host jurisdiction of 700,000 people and growing, we have valuable lived experience, existing partnerships and a strong voice. The lead and develop partnerships goal also recognizes opportunities to share our expertise as a nuclear community through the Canadian Association of Nuclear Host Communities and to pursue research with our post-secondary institutions. In addition, through greater information sharing and collaboration, we also aim to increase knowledge sharing between the region and other municipalities, Indigenous nations, and provincial and federal ministries and agencies on the experience of being a nuclear host community. We'll increase the capacity of Durham Region to engage in and influence nuclear policy and provincial and federal decision making, increase collaboration on environmental stewardship and economic opportunities with Indigenous communities, OPG and other stakeholders, improve communication, cooperation and alignment with local area municipalities, other nuclear communities, Indigenous rights holders and local elected officials on matters related to the nuclear sector and increase our interaction and cooperation with the nuclear industry, academia and provincial and federal ministries and agencies. Next slide. This strategy outlines the roles the region intends to play and recognizes the value and need for partnership. We are excited to be taking on this leadership role and to demonstrate the value of collaboration as we work toward our shared goals. Thank you so much everyone for attending this event today. You can download the strategy by visiting durham.ca forward slash nuclear. And now I'm going to turn it over to Simon Gill, who'll be facilitating our next session. Thank you, Caitlin. That was fantastic. Very exciting strategy. Good morning and welcome. I'm Simon, the Director of Economic Development and Tourism with the Region of Durham. Canada's nuclear industry, the seventh largest in the world, is located here, primarily in Ontario. And the epicenter is Durham Region, home to two of Ontario Power Generation's nuclear generating stations. Durham Region's business community is at the forefront of accelerating energy innovation. And our region includes a vibrant cluster of organizations in the nuclear sector. As the region launches the nuclear sector strategy, I'm excited to be the lead for the Maximize Prosperity Goal. And today I'm joined by an exceptional panel, including Curve Lake First Nation, academia, the nuclear industry, and municipal government. So I'll begin by introducing our six panelists. Katie young Saddlesey is the Chief Operating Officer for Curve Lake First Nation. Katie has more than 20 years experience in the economic development industry, including winning Economic Development Officer of the Year at the Cando Conference in 2019. Katie is dedicated to community development through smart strategies, strong communication, and thorough planning. 
Next, I'll introduce Sheila Hall, the Executive Director for Clarington Board of Trade and Office of Economic Development. Sheila's strong partnerships with all levels of government and organization leaders provides a platform for her team to lead Clarington business growth and retention and help to build a sustainable economic climate for the Clarington community. Sheila and her team have strong ties in the nuclear sector, both with OPG and supply chain companies. We're also joined by Fiaz Jadun, the Director of Economic Development and Strategic Projects for the City of Pickering. Fiaz is responsible for managing the city's nuclear file by working with internal and external stakeholders. His department is currently managing the coordinated study between the city, region, and OPG on the financial, economic, and social impacts of the decommissioning of Pickering Nuclear. Dr. Ron Oberth is the President and CEO of the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries, OCNI, an industry association that represents 240 private sector companies that supply equipment and services to Canadian and offshore nuclear power plants. Ron completed the ICD Rotman Director's Education Program and was invited to serve on the IBB National Pension Fund's Clean Energy Strategy Advisory Committee. Ron's also a member of the Advisory Board to the Faculty of Energy Systems and Nuclear Science at Ontech University. Next, I'll introduce Dr. Kirk Atkinson, the founding director of the Center for Small Module Reactors an associate professor and industrial research chair in health, physics, and environmental safety at Ontech University. Since 2012, he's worked on applications of high performance computing and computational methods development, currently leading the development of Made in Canada Caribou code for predicting the consequences of nuclear or radiological incidents. He's an expert on SMRs in the marine context and was part of the team assessing nuclear power options for, the, for future Royal Navy submarines. And lastly, we're joined by Sandra Austin, Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Region of Durham. Sandra's team is responsible for the Regional Strategic Plan and Organizational Performance, Environmental Sustainability and Climate Change, Government and Community Relations, Innovation and Research, and key policy files, including the development of this nuclear strategy. Sandra have previously held policy roles in the federal and provincial governments, including the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, Ontario's Cabinet, Cabinet Office for Intergovernmental Affairs, and the Ministry of Finance. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from all our panelists today on their unique perspectives on maximizing prosperity for Durham Region. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from you. If you have questions for our panel, please enter them into the chat, the bubble at the top with the question mark and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible in the time we have today. So welcome to our six panelists, and I'm gonna jump right in with the first question. So kicking things off, Durham Region is a premier nuclear community offering fantastic opportunities for businesses that are in the energy and environment space to grow with a focus on transitioning to cleaner and more sustainable economy. So the question is from a business perspective, what do you think is the one thing that sets Durham Region apart from other communities? And uh, I think to kick things off, let's start with Sheila. So as the Clarington Board of Trade, you obviously work directly with a number of nuclear companies uh, located in Clarington near the Darlington facility. So I'd like to hear from you. What sets Durham apart? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for inviting me today. So the region has a strong reputation in the energy as ener for energy excellence with successful operation of Pickering and Darlington for close to half a century. That's crazy, right? Um, and has seen great investment in the sector. We have well-educated and supportive uh, base to build a strong foundation with innovative partnerships and collaboration to capture future growth. At the end of the day, people like to be with like-minded people. So, um, Durham is, is set far apart in that regard, so. <laughs> no, that's very true. How about how about you, Ron? What, what are your thoughts? Oh, you're muted. Five okay. things come to mind immediately, Simon. Uh, you're the home of, Durham is the home of one of the world's largest infrastructure projects at Darlington. It's the home of the first grid scale SMR to be deployed in North America. It'll be the home of one of the largest decommissioning projects ever at, at Pickering. 
and it's also the home of Ontario Tech and Durham College. So you bring those five things together, plus a dynamic community leadership that we heard from this morning. And I think the future looks very exciting for Durham. Absolutely, our post-secondary excellence here truly, I think, sets Durham apart. It's a great point. Uh, Fias, how about you? What are, what are your thoughts? Well, first off, thank you for the invitation uh, for being here. Um, I, I think two words come to mind when we talk about Durham region and what sets us apart from other communities, and that's um, one of the one of the words was used by my colleague Sheila. And the two words are reputation and experience. We are a experience region that ha that has two nuclear facilities. We have the supply chain, and our local governments and our regional governments have done an enormous amount of work to build relationships with our supply chain that allows us to build on that nuclear industry within our region. And I feel that at times we we undervalue how important it is for us to be a part um, a, a part of that network of businesses within Durham region and how much they have grown over the years. And as Ron said, you know, we're, we're going to be soon home to the largest decommissioning project in the world and in Sheila's backyard, the, the one of the largest infrastructure projects in Canada. So very exciting times for Durham region. Uh, I completely agree. I think that that experience, that decades long experience uh, will really set us up well for uh, for the next phase of nuclear globally, which uh, it leads me to my next question, actually, SMRs. So the, the Darlington New Nuclear Project is going to be the first on-grid SMR in Canada and maybe the world. And a key action in the nuclear strategy is for the region to advocate for that SMR technology development and for manufacturing associated with it to be rooted right here in Durham region. So how do we capture that manufacturing, all of that economic growth that goes along with being a first mover in SMRs? What actions do you think the region can take to make this a reality? So Ron, I'll, I'll go back to you to, to start here. You know, having a good understanding of the landscape and all of the suppliers that make up the, the vibrancy of this, of this uh, industry, tell us how Durham can, can be a leader here. Um, the uh, the SMR project that was announced uh, in late 2021, going to GE Attache uh, and to construct their BWR X300 at Darlington, means that uh, that Durham is now well placed to host some of the new uh, fabrication technologies that are going to be required for this new technology. Our can-do supply chain. Uh, is very experienced, but it will require some retooling and reskilling uh, to meet the demands of, of this new fleet of, well, I'm, I'm saying fleet of reactors. We've announced one, but I'm very optimistic and confident that we will need more than one uh, 300 to meet Ontario's growing electricity demands through electrification. So I think it's now is the time for Durham Region to provide incentives to attract companies that are going to have to build up a new production line uh, for some BWR X300 components right here in Durham. Secondly, uh, about on January the 12th, OCNI announced the formation of an organization called CAMINA, which stands for Canadian Advanced Manufacturing in Nuclear Alliance. I've appointed a director of that alliance, and I think there may be a good opportunity for Durham Region to take some leadership in advanced manufacturing research and development to enable that new technology to be deployed to uh, improve the performance and uh, and the and reduce the cost of SMR equipment. So those two things, let's capitalize on some retooling uh, and let's maybe develop here in Durham Region a center of advanced manufacturing research that will enable us to uh, leapfrog into some of the new advanced manufacturing technologies here in Durham. Yeah, that that a lot that research alliance. It sounds like definitely a great opportunity and I I would agree with you I think that uh, you know ultimately we're going to need more than one many more than yeah. one to meet our to meet our climate goals so like here on the technology side so Dr Atkinson you're the SMR expert Kirk you want to you want to weigh in on this one just searching for the unmute button <laughs> So, <laughs> you hear me? Yep. You hear me? Okay, good. It's messing up. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me this morning. Uh, I come from the UK. Uh, we've been doing uh, SMRs 
for 60 years on submarines. In Derby, a city roughly the same size as Oshawa, they have uh, long had factory space for building SMRs within uh, within the city limits. It's it's a it's a done thing. It's accepted by the community. Here in in Durham region, we have this very useful situation where we have a nexus of transport links of skilled workforce in the manufacturing sector, nuclear expertise, but I think most importantly, room to grow. And I think it's that room to grow that is perhaps the most important most important thing. Uh, one of the challenges of coming from, from Europe is there isn't the space. Uh, here we have that and we can exploit it. Ron was just talking about his uh, initiative for advanced manufacturing. Uh, in the UK, there's been quite a few efforts over the last few years in, in this area, especially with regards to nuclear. So I think that's also an area where Durham can certainly play a role. If we open up the, the, the region, open up facilities, we'll be able to bring in more companies, newer companies, perhaps spinning out of the university sector. Uh, and that will have create a virtuous circle in terms of bringing in more jobs, more more skilled people and just grow the region as a whole. Obviously, there's business levers as well uh, that, that can be employed by the region, whether that's through taxation or through opening up city space uh, for uh, for nominal sums. Uh, but all of these things all factor in into a holistic holistic plan what I think your uh, nuclear strategy is doing. Oh, that's great. I, I love how you you put it, you know, room to grow. Durham definitely has room to grow. And I know a top priority of council, uh, which is being actioned right now, is making sure we have a steady supply of vacant, ready uh, employment lands to develop. So so my colleagues uh, across the region and I are working on that and here at the region. And, and actually, one of my colleagues is a panelist, Fiaz. Maybe I'll ask you, what are your thoughts on how you think Durham Region can can make this SMR, re, uh, you know, take advantage and make this a reality here in Durham for SMRs? Thanks, Simon. Well, I, I think uh, the first thing we need to do is tell our story, you know, and I think the world needs to hear Durham's story. We're leaders in the nuclear industry. We have a vast amount of opportunities here. We have some of the leading supply chain of businesses that are working on the nuclear file, and we need to take advantage of that. And working with our post-secondary institutions, Ontario Tech University and others, I think there's a collaborative effort we can all put forward but with respect to knowing how we can attract those SMR type jobs, those investments in our region. And, you know, I also think that it's an opportunity for the region and the local area municipalities to work um, hand in hand with the nuclear industry supply chain as well to really promote this opportunity, you know, the, the, the strategy speaks to the SMRs. Now, now we're at the point where we need to talk about the implementation part of it and how can we do that. Traditional economic development focused on investment attraction. Here is a excellent uh, target sector for us to look after and, and work together on. So uh, again, I, I feel that we, we need to tell our story. We need to tell the world who we are and or the experience we bring to the table um, and you know, and, and the supply chain we have within our region. Absolutely. Uh, telling the story because we actually have a tremendous story to tell. It's absolutely fantastic. You know, you hear all the fantastic thing that's, things that are going on in Durham region and, you know, getting the word out about that. Sheila, what, what do you think? Uh, well, so I echo a lot of what my colleagues have said. Transportation, access to, to easy space uh, to move into are all really important. Um, creating that, that, that uh, welcoming environment. Um, but I also think we need to uh, continue to work on on the the work that's rooted in Durham in creating a welcoming community uh, for the nuclear sector. Um, you know, we're we're at this new precipice in in the nuclear sector where we're we're now talking about innovative things like SMRs and isotopes and um, 
all the all the great offshoot things and how do they interconnect to our community that's already here the businesses that are already here um, that that maybe we wouldn't traditionally look at as nuclear uh, businesses but they still feed into that industry um, and others and so you know we're, we're at such a great place for collaboration um, and and so I think that Durham um, and the industry have done a really great job in getting that work started over the last however many decades uh, that we've been doing that um, so building on that I think is the most important thing so it probably comes back to Fiazza's point about communication and who we are what we do and what we've been doing um, and where we're going next. Definitely, definitely. No, thank you for that. So we'll, we'll jump to the next question, and it, it looks to me like it's a great question, I think, for maybe Sandra and Katie. So I'll give you guys advanced warning, you're gonna be on deck. So when developing the nuclear sector strategy, one of the things mentioned over and over during our focus groups was that OPG, First Nation communities, municipalities, supply chain companies, local post-secondary institutions, they all have a role to play in better educating the broader community. How do you think collaboration on education initiatives can help contribute to a broader public understanding of the nuclear sector and its relevance to clean energy? So I'll try Katie first, wondering if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, there seems a bit of a delay with the unmute button, but thank you, Simon. Um, so as nuclear energy continues to evolve, I think it's extremely important to ensure that environmental impacts continue to be the strongest consideration. Consultation with Indigenous community people who have knowledge to share regarding the history of the land and the environmental protection should be an integral part of the process. Starting in a space that allows for respectful knowledge sharing between the nuclear sector partners and Indigenous people can help ensure that we are all starting from a place of understanding. Our involvement in processes such as the Durham nuclear sector strategy is an example of how Indigenous com communities can contribute in a meaningful way to achieve achieve the overall goals. For example, in pursuing further innovations in cleaner and more sustainable energy technologies. Education should be de designed in an appropriate way to reach audiences of all ages and that will allow for engagement along with education. There has to be back and forth conversation or Indigenous communities will feel that they are a part of this and it is extremely important as we move forward to acknowledge that they have a place to play in this in this uh, in the future of, uh, of nuclear. So, you know, there's there has to be a balanced and comprehensive approach as we move forward with educating communities and educating the, the general population. And I'm a firm believer this needs to start at a at a young age. I think it's something that we can start bringing into schools at a, at a you know age appropriate um, lessons for for children that are that are even in like elementary levels. That there's a good way that we can start to to make this almost normalize it as we as we start to educate. But I think right now we have to start with the general population and there needs to be a clear understanding and a comfort level that comes from the communities before we're able to really move forward in an authentic way. So I just want to say that while we have a lot to learn still about uh, nuclear energy, we do, <laughs> maybe some of you don't, but we do. <laughs> You may be surprised by how much that you could learn from it, about the land and its resources from Indigenous people as well. Well, that's, that's fantastic. It's, uh, you know, great, great to hear content for all ages, critically mm -hmm. important. And then education going both ways, right? We educate one another. I think that's uh, both really great points. Sandra, how about you? What are your thoughts? Yes, thanks very much, Simon. It's an excellent question and uh, agree with everything that that Katie mentioned, certainly. Um, collaboration is so critical to all of this work. That's really what gives us that opportunity to step outside our own realms of, of knowledge and experience and expertise and gives us the opportunity to understand better the perspectives of others. So we know that we all have really important messages and information to share with the community. 
and in many respects, it's our, our goals, especially as we're talking about the, the need for environmental sustainability, the need to achieve net zero targets by 2050. These are all the same. We all have the same goals. We're all striving for the same objectives. And so when we're collaborating and when we're partnering, I think it's really critical to think about who is the messenger in each of these instances. There are certainly some messages that are much better sent by industry representatives. And then there are others that, you know, they, we think about kind of trust indices and, and who is it that people are trusting. And in many instances, we're talking about that trust coming from academia, coming from scientists, coming from community leaders, coming from governments, and, and certainly coming from First Nations, uh, where we all do have a lot to learn about that expertise. And so it's really through this collaboration, I think, that we can start looking at um, some creative and effective approaches to share this information so that we are approaching um, our actions in, in a little bit more of a, a unified voice and we can reach a much broader audience. Great, great point. Uh, maybe OCNN, I'm curious, Ron, you might have some thoughts on this. How do you think that these broad groups collaborating on educational activities can contribute to broader public understanding? Oh, you're muted again, Ron. Um, what I'd like to add to this conversation is uh, OCI has been very effective over the last couple of years in hosting uh, community events at supplier locations. So, for example, uh, over the last three years, we've had events at uh, four companies located here in Durham: Tetra Tech in Pickering, Aerotech in Whitby. Uh, Black and McDonald in Clarington and back to UCC in, in Pickering. And what we've done at these events is we invite uh, the local MPP, the local mayor, councillors and other community leaders to come to the supplier's location, learn about uh, the supplier's role in a collaborative integrated nuclear industry. And I just want to underscore that point that our industry is strong because we have an integration among suppliers and the supply chain working closely with our with our end customers. And what these events have done is they've helped inform, and I, I prefer the word inform rather than educate, inform community leaders about what's happening in their community and how the companies in their community are, are, are contributing to and enabling our industry to succeed. And I think that information has then spreads out from the local community, uh, through their leaders, through understanding on the council of what nuclear industry is. It's not just a lot of uh, people working at OPG and Pickering, but it's an integrated collaborative network of small and medium sized enterprises across Ontario with a good number of them located here in Durham. So I think we can use our suppliers uh, as another vehicle to integrate and interface with uh, with members of their community and neighbors and, and partners. Well, that's great. So bringing in that supply chain and informing, not educating. Right? Yeah. Very interesting. Kirk, how about yourself? What do you do? You have any thoughts on this one? Just hunt, hunting for the mute button again. <laughs> Okay, well, maybe we'll we'll jump to the next question, Kirk, and, and uh, keep tracking down that mute button. But I, what I'm going to do really quickly is take a question from the crowd, uh, from the audience. We got a really great one in the Q&A bubble. And keep in mind, you can ask a question anytime with that uh, question bubble that has the question mark in it. So I'll go to this one. What are the opportunities for district energy integration with the SMR project? A lot of new development happening in South Clarington that might benefit from low carbon energy sources, helping the region meet its GHG emission reduction target. So very cool question, I think. Um, and we've got a couple great panelists to maybe answer. I'm thinking Sheila and Sandra potentially, but, but maybe Sandra, you wanna take a first crack at that one? 
Uh, yes, so thank you very much for the question. In terms of district energy, certainly there are um, opportunities that we're, we're looking at uh, for co-location. And this is again where it comes back to kind of that partnership development and, and what specific pieces um, can we be looking for forward to working on together. Um, certainly the, the region has a, a, a key interest in this space and are working closely with our economic development counterparts uh, in Clarington and Pickering to, to look at what those opportunities might be. Um, there's additional partnerships uh, happening throughout the region, certainly, but working with uh, respected um, energy providers is, is certainly one way that, that we can uh, advance this a little more quickly than we would otherwise be able to do. Yeah, no, very interesting. And, and, you know, all of these really unique new technology solutions for climate change coming together. I think, you know, one potential area for those to come together is the energy park. Maybe Sheila, do you want to weigh in at all on, you know, what's going on down in the energy park there and, you know, how these, these new technologies for solving the clean energy problem we're facing are coming together? Sure, I'll, I'll try. Not an engineer, so um, I'm speaking from an active voice here. Um, so I, I think there's great opportunity for that. Um, as we move down the path in that conversation, so um, the proximity of the new SMR to the existing uh, Darlington plant, um, we've got the energy park uh, that is adjacent to, to both of those projects um, with the Durham Energy from Waste Facility. We've got um, some land in the energy park uh, that is ready uh, to be developed, um, some existing buildings that could take advantage. So I think there's a real cluster development growing in that South Curtis area um, and the opportunities that connect to the potential go, future go, let's say future go uh, station in South Curtis, um, I, I think are, are brewing up a perfect storm for that innovative development to happen. No, I totally agree. And, and of course, Ontario Power Generation's new headquarters, right, in the energy of park, course, yeah. over 2,000 people. And, you know, the future uh, Curtis Go station with the with the Go East extension, you know, bringing all day two-way high order transit. So lots going on down there. And um, so anyway, we'll jump to the next question here. So a key outcome of the region's nuclear sector strategy is to develop a strong, diverse talent pipeline to support a nuclear energy innovation ecosystem in partnership with industry and post-secondary institutions. How do we draw this talent to Durham and what is that ecosystem looking for? So very interesting question. We need to solve, you know, talent will be the, the currency of our future energy economy. How do we how do we meet the needs of that of that ecosystem? Sandra, do you want to take a first crack at that? Absolutely, Simon. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Um, I think one of the key ways that we can work to attract talent is really by supporting students in their learning. So in Durham Region, we have an exceptional experiential learning program with our local post-secondary institutions that's called City Studio Durham. So City Studio really provides tomorrow's leaders um, and municipal governments the ability to work together to solve some real world problems. So students have the opportunity to develop their local network, to apply their skills, to apply their creativity, to gain some valuable experience and really strengthen their connection with the Durham community. And so it's our hope that once those connections are strengthened, they've been learning here, they're going to stay and apply what they've learned after graduation. And so when we were going through the nuclear sector strategy development, we had two supporting city studio projects underway. The first was a partnership with Ontario Tech University. And here we had students doing a lot of that background research into some international decommissioning projects and what are some of the lessons that can be learned for municipal governments like Durham Region. And then the second was a partnership with Durham College. And this one in particular, we had students exploring international examples of partnership agreements between municipalities and the nuclear industry. And so City Studio was really a way to extend the knowledge and the capacity of regional staff who were working on the strategy itself 
but also a way to educate and engage young people and our, our current students about the sector and help them develop that kind of entrepreneurial spirit that we're going to be looking for in the talent pipeline and that ability really to start tackling some real world challenges that, that we're looking at in our challenges and opportunities that we're looking at in our community. So those kinds of partnerships uh, certainly I think are helpful and valuable. Absolutely. And, you know, with every challenge is, you know, comes an equal uh, opportunity, right? And and I think the talent pipeline for the nuclear sector is definitely an opportunity, particularly with our strong post-secondary. And Kirk, maybe I'll pick on you here um, if we can, uh, if we can locate your, yeah, we found your unmute button. Perfect. Uh, you work with students every day, you know, anything to, to chime in on the, on the talent pipeline? So one of the things I would say about the post-secondary sector here in in durham is we're largely a commuter school yeah we get a lot of people that from the local area that come we need to branch out and and think more widely try and bring more people to the to to, to the region for for opportunities to to grow their career uh and to grow their life i mean take me for instance I, i've moved from six thousand kilometers away in the uk to durham I was excited by the opportunities here, uh, the energy, you know, quote unquote, energy uh, of, of the region, the, the, the room for growth. Uh, I think important things to think about for, for uh, bringing workforce though, is to, is to make clear what opportunities there are. In the, in the intros earlier, uh, there was conversation about the waterfront at, at Pickering. Uh, we got to think about the 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 social things. It's a, it's a wider piece than just employment. Uh, it's it's that holistic kind of thinking. Uh, and so, I think when we make that clear that there is the opportunity to to grow a life as well as have a really good job for the future that's gonna gonna last, I think they're the messages we need to really take forward. Oh, that's great. That's really great. I I totally agree. I'm going to go to a question from the from the audience again here too. This is a really neat one, and I'll give uh, Ron and Fia as a heads up because I'm going to pick on you with this one. So the question from the audience is: What might the key markets and applications for SMRs be in Canada? So this goes to us becoming that you know that central hub for SMR technology and exporting that you know that technology and that knowledge and that expertise around Canada and also around the world, of course. But so let's talk about those key markets and applications in Canada. Where where do these go? So Ron, maybe I'll I'll ask you first. Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, I think one of the advantages of SMRs is their small footprint and their versatility. Um, we see SMRs or the industry is looking at SMRs as, a, as an energy source, not just the traditional electricity source. And so I think there's an opportunity in Durham, uh, in Kirk's organization at Ontario Tech, and perhaps at Durham College as well, to look at how you can use the energy from, uh, from an SMR for resource extraction, uh, perhaps for unique isotope production applications, and in the production of hydrogen uh, as a fuel for transportation, as a medium for um, agriculture and uh, in, improving it through uh, through ammonia, through green ammonia. Uh, and so I think the hydrogen strategies that have been announced federally and provincially come together very nicely with the with the SMR program to give us a holistic integrated way to reach net zero by 2050. And just you know tagging on to the previous question, the young people bring an idealism. Uh, to the world that that maybe uh, the older generation didn't have, and they see, you know, saving the climate. They see isotope production in terms of improving the health outcomes for people, uh, and using technologies to help us prevent the next uh, pandemic. Uh, would be things that could be looked at, and how you can tie SMR technology into some of these new innovations to get us to net zero by 2050. Oh, absolutely. And Ron, we're making some of those life-saving isotopes right here in Durham yeah. region. PG is has a number of different isotope lines that uh, that are, you know, diagnosing cancers and, and treating, you know, treating serious diseases. So absolutely, you know, one of the markets there for sure. Maybe Fiaz or, or even Kirk, do either of you have any thoughts on you know, types of markets and applications in Canada 
either of you guys want to jump well, in here? Yes. Well, well, I think Ron has covered off a lot of it, and and I think it goes back to the point that you know, as as we progress in in the technology and as we begin to grow that experience in the SMR in Durham region, that we really need to collaborate and work with our post-secondary education institutions, Ontario Tech, Durham College, and others to really be the, the face of the whole project and how it could impact other areas within Ontario and Canada as well. And you mentioned isotopes, um, Simon, and I, I think, you know, Durham being a community, uh, a region that's taking the lead on the development of isotopes is, is very unique. And I, I think it's an opportunity for us to really go to other areas and say, we have the technology, we have the opportunities here. Let's let's work together and let's collaborate. So that, that those are my thoughts on the technology of SMRs and how we can grow it within the industries. That's great, thanks. Kirk, anything anything to add before we jump to the next question? Yeah, I just, just wanted to sort of echo something that, that Ron said about hydrogen. I mean, probably most people don't, don't realize that uh, that Ontario Tech has for a, the longest time been a, been a world leader in actually uh, some of the technologies for hydrogen production. And it, what SMRs will do is they will open up that opportunity to make hydrogen a reality. Nuclear in general is the same. Uh, it's something that we won't be able to do with the more intermittent supply uh, energy sources that uh, that exist. So, so I really think that is a that is a growth area, and we're obviously uh, that and electrification of, of vehicles, of course. You know, when we want to think about electrification, we have a very big auto sector here in uh, in Durham region uh, and in Southern Ontario more generally. Uh, as we move more towards electric cars, uh, we're going to need more power. Yeah, and we can't rely on uh, on on the wind or the sun to give us that power all the time. It's part of the mix, but it's not there all the time. Nuclear is. Yeah, I know I charge my car overnight and it you know charges at up to 10 kilowatts, right? As soon as we all start charging our cars, it's going to change the grid quite a bit. So thank you very much for those for those thoughts on that question and for the question. Uh, so I'll jump to the next one. Generations of Indigenous peoples have systematically been excluded from the decision-making processes that created the nuclear industry in this area. How can we continue to strengthen engagement and collaboration with Indigenous communities in business opportunities in the nuclear sector? A very important question for us. So maybe some, some reflection on that. Diaz, do you want to do you want to kick us off, maybe? Well, I, I think um, I, I think Katie has said it uh, at her earlier on in her comments, and that is, you know, having the opportunity to really um, work together with the communities. But from my end, you know, and this is, has to do with the, the the nuclear sector, and it has to do with other sectors as well as part of my role with the city, and that is, you know, working together with those indigenous communities and, you know. Um, educating all parties as to what this means and how we can collaborate and work together. You know, I, I know, you know, it, it, it's one of those missed opportunities in, in the past years that we, we haven't really worked together. And, you know, we certainly don't want to miss those opportunities. Again, nuclear being such a large industry within Durham region and in the future of nuclear. And I think it's imperative that we, we, we don't miss that boat of working together with our different communities and educating each other and seeing how we can work together on not only providing the resources required, but also how we can help the growth of the sector within our region as well. So I think that, you know, it's 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 a, one of those priority type projects and priority type uh, factors that need to be considered. Yeah, thank you. Kirk, what are your thoughts on this one? So I'm a... Uh... I'm more of a newcomer to these lands than 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 most of the people probably watching this uh, th this uh, broadcast. I think nuclear more generally creates suspicion, and probably not probably none more so than in indigenous communities. Uh, we we see it. We have in, we have put facilities on land without consultation uh, in in large part throughout history. 
I think one of the things that we could do to to bring in more indigenous engagement in this area is to make the point that nuclear energy is actually from the earth. Yeah, it's not something that's different. Yeah, it's not something that's artificial. It's from the earth and ultimately will be returned to the earth. So I think that's an important thing to think about when you take uh, understanding of putting facilities on on land and getting people involved in business because they're not going to want to be involved in business if you uh, if you have a suspicion of the technology. I think for far too long, something I wanted to say earlier, for far too long, the conversation around nuclear has uh, has drifted towards why things like waste is bad. Waste isn't bad. Nuclear waste is actually one of its assets, I would say, uh, because of the fact that we have such regulation around it. We control it. Yeah, we're living in a world now where we're trying to uh, prevent or mitigate climate change. That means there's lots of opportunities throughout, uh, whether it's through renewable energy or, or nuclear. Everything has a consequence. Everything. We need to consider things on a, on a level playing field and make make obvious where there's opportunity to 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 grow uh, an opportunity to uh, to grow economically. Uh, and I think that's an that's an important and an important factor to, to, to think about. Uh, and I think. As. Energy in general. Involves the use of the land and involves uh, involves construction. Uh, making these kind of uh, considerations, this level playing field thinking uh, understood will encourage more indigenous uh, engagement in the in the industry. Thanks. Simon, thank you. Ron's got us. Hey, can I, Ron. Let me answer this one as well. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that OCNI has a strong commitment to indigenous engagement in nuclear. And over the last year, with funding from the Ontario Ministry of Job Creation, Training and Development, uh, or their Skills Development Program, we have uh, attracted 26 Indigenous people and 10 women to be trained and placed in the nuclear sector. And we've actually exceeded the target. We have uh, attracted 26 young Indigenous people uh, and uh, placed them in the nuclear sector, nine of whom were uh, recruited and placed right here in Pickering. So by engaging young indigenous people in the industry, so they see not only that they're, that that nuclear energy is bringing clean energy to the region, but the indigenous young people in, in Katie's uh, group and in others are actually participating in the projects and they they derive the benefits. It's a, it's a fast growing demographic. We need a pipeline of talent. And I think young indigenous people present a great opportunity to bring them into our industry so they understand it, communicate with the elders in their community uh, and and develop the a, a collaborative approach to uh, nuclear development in the region. So so connecting with youth, I think that's yeah. a theme that's come up uh, already in this discussion. Uh, Sandra and Sheila, do you have any thoughts? I, I want to hand it over to Katie for her thoughts uh, last on this, but do you want to jump in first? Either of you? Sure, I'm happy to to take this one too, Simon. Thank you. Um, so in this strategy in particular, um, we were very pleased to be able to engage with Curve Lake First Nation and also Mississauga, the Scugog Island First Nation directly on the development of the strategy. Um, there are so many opportunities to strengthen our engagement and our collaboration. And a key piece of this, I think, is is really starting those conversations early. It's our responsibility to to listen and understand what kind of engagement and collaboration is is really desired and how we as governments can can really be those um, helpful and respected partners. So there's there's certainly not a one size fits all approach, um, but the important thing for us is being forthcoming about projects and opportunities so that we are open to collaboration and and wide scale change. So for the strategy itself, um, you you heard at the outset um, in 
in Chief Wee Chung's uh, welcome remarks that we took the approach of being able to co-create some of the language that was included throughout the document. And so I will tell you, this, this is really something that falls outside of how governments would traditionally develop strategies. Um, but we really see that as, as our responsibility to undertake those opportunities of, of that rich collaboration. And the, the insights that we gained were so valuable and ultimately put us in a better position to have more inclusive strategy developments. And that extends to economic development and, and business attraction as well. And so reconciliation um, and inclusion in, in decision making is, is really our responsibility. Um, but I'm hoping, uh, Katie, if you can speak a little bit. So in general and not just with with business opportunities um you know it, it it's our education to learn but how can we be better at engaging indigenous communities uh, when it comes to the nuclear sector or more broadly yeah Kate, katie I'd, I'd love for you to weigh in on this okay i think i'm unmuted <laughs> okay. yep. so it seems i think i've got the same issue with kirk we've got a bit of a delay when we unmute <laughs> so just to be patient with us so i gave myself lots of time this time so i would say like on a grand scale there's multiple levels of this that i think we need to consider but on the on a on one scale probably a, a grand scale yes like we share the land we share the resources this is what the treaties have done they've they've created this responsibility for all of us to share this and its resources so we need to find meaningful ways to include first nations in the protections of the land first and foremost the the environment needs to come first before the economic partnerships our communities are not, and our people are not going to want to be involved in a partnership that does not that is going to see uh, the earth hurt in any way. So that those things have to come first. And in an even bigger way, like we need to start looking at ecological partnerships and, and consider the, on a grand scale, like what we can do as we move forward to protect protect the land, protect the earth. It's all we have. We don't have we don't have planet B as they say, right? So it needs to start with community engagement and we need to ensure that Indigenous people have the information that they need and a forum to have open discussions where their questions can be answered. There needs to be a great level of understanding at, on the onset, right at the beginning of these partnerships so that we are having open dialogue. Um, and, and it takes time and it's not, it's not a small process because there are a lot of Indigenous communities and we don't always all have the same ideals. Or not, um, we get, generally don't take a pan-Indigenous approach to, to items like this. It's community by community decisions. And one of the beautiful things about working with a First Nation is that we do engage with our community. We speak to our members. We ask them what their desires are. We go out and we speak to the elders. We go and we speak to the youth. And we go out and we try to get as many opinions as we can before we move forward with projects. So it does take a little bit more time, but it's a really thorough and it's a beautiful process that we go through in order to, to gather feedback. Our leadership and our staff need to be engaged early as well in processes where we can sit down together and discuss opportunities and what are real and good fits for everybody. And not just for today, but for the future as well. Everything that we do in Curve Lake, we look to the future, the seven generations to follow. What are we doing to improve things for them and to make decisions now that are going to be to their benefit? <clears throat> We all need to understand and acknowledge the history of nuclear energy in order to ensure that we don't we move forward in a better way to benefit those future generations. And as I've said repeatedly, the youth must be included in any discussions about opportunities for the future because ultimately our children are going to be the ones that inherit the decisions that we're making today. So if they don't own them and they don't participate in making those decisions, they're not going to want to continue forward with them because they may not understand why the decisions were made. I think there also needs to be an understanding of the abilities and the size and the scope of Indigenous business. So on the much uh, more of a micro level, our, our businesses are generally small. Going through the processes to work with OPG are, is very onerous. It can be very difficult for a small um, for a small company to get involved in some of the larger industries because they have to go through so many systems. Indigenous business operates differently as well. 
um, with the, you know, there's not, you may not have a business number because you don't need one because you don't have taxable income. Like there's, there's different ways that we, that they work that is not the same as offers or businesses. So I really think it's important that we have those discussions that people that are interested in working with us come out to the community, speak to the community, speak to the businesses, speak to the leadership and really take the opportunity to understand why it's different and why things need to be a little bit a little bit adaptable while when you're working with our communities because it's not as cut and dry as just coming out and and okay you're in the you're in the Ariba system now you can work with us like it's not it's not that simple so I think that there's you know there's a great level of understanding it needs to start start at a micro level in order to do proper engagement so I think that that's kind of um a, a overview of some of the challenges that we might face as we move forward I don't think that anything is is insurmountable, um, but we do have some work to do, and we're. But I truly believe that we can we can work to find a good way forward. That's that's an incredible uh, thank incredible response. Thank you for all those wonderful thoughts. Um, uh, so we've got a couple more questions from the audience, but I think they might be better questions for my colleague Gary in the next set in the next segment about growing understanding questions about challenges for social acceptance in rural areas and you know what is the real green nature of SMR. So I'll leave those for Gary and I've got a couple more questions for our growing prosperity panelists as we close out the uh, close out the discussion. So second last one is the retirement of Pickering nuclear. It's quickly approaching. The end of commercial operations will initiate the world's largest decommissioning project and create tremendous opportunities as OPG looks towards repurposing the site. What are some key activities you'd like to see happen at the Pickering Nuclear site? And I'll maybe ask Fiaz maybe to kick this one off, being an economic development director for Pickering. Thank you, Simon. And this one is the most exciting projects that I, I feel uh, at the city here. Um, I think. Like, like you said, it, it is the world's largest decommissioning project. And at times, and, and I've said this before, we are undervaluing the opportunities for Durham Region and Pickering here. This is an opportunity where we can put Durham Region and Pickering on the map as a leader on center of excellence for nuclear technology when other facilities across the world can come to Pickering and learn from what has happened in Pickering. I think the opportunities of attracting the talent and the business and the businesses from across the world to work on this decommissioning project is is amazing and and and, and the most important factor here that I want to be able to share with our community is how this is a great new story for our community and our region. And, and that's something we're working on as part of our nuclear study with uh, ACOM in the region and OPG as well as, you know, how this is a good news story. And, you know, in years, past years, there, there's been lots of negative perception about the nuclear industry and what does decommissioning mean and how is that going to impact my home or my job? And, and we really need to tell the community that this is a great news story. We're going to have some of the world's best talent in, in some of the world's best businesses relocate to Durham region uh, that are going to work on not only the decommissioning but also on the new uh, refurb as well. So very excited for this project um, and uh, looking forward to the years to come as we can grow uh, the region's supply chain of nuclear businesses um, and collaborating with the various stakeholders. I completely agree Fiaz, this is a good news story. We've got, we've got, I mean, there's not just one, there's more than one biggest in Canada, first in, or sorry, biggest in the world, first in the world. You know, we've got this collection of incredible global stories. What a, you know, what a great story to tell. Katie, I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, on Pickering Nuclear and the site and the opportunities that come with decommissioning. Yeah, so we, we have to look at this in a bit of a different capacity as we're not uh, nuclear engineers by any means and, and are part of this partnership. But I think that it's really important to our communities that that land is given the time to heal and restore itself and uh, that the proper measures are taken to return it to any areas that are, are planning to be turned or to green space, space are done uh, at the highest of standards. So this would include um, indigenous based knowledge possibly and practices to complement western based requirements and standards. So I think that there's another place there at the table for indigenous knowledge to come forward. 
Um, and though we we don't know what the future is going to hold for Pickering, like when we started talking about this question just in the in discussions, like it's so it's such a huge thought for us, like to to think 50 years down the road and and so on and what this is going to look like. But um, we just think that like right now we're focusing on building the relationships and building these these partnerships and and memorandums and whatever to ensure that we are building the relationships to ensure that that indigenous knowledge is considered and that the right people are at the tables to speak for indigenous people as we move forward. So I think you know. Like we've said, the Indigenous community wasn't at the table for a long time, so we're we're new to this discussion. We're fairly new to participating in 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 you know talking about the future of these sites. So I think right now our focus is more on ensuring that that we continue to have a place at that table as those decisions are made and that the voices of Indigenous people are heard. Absolutely, absolutely. So Sandra, the, the region is a key a key player in this uh, economic study for Pickering. I'm curious if you want to weigh in here. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm particularly excited about what's to come for this site. Um, so we know commercial electricity generation will be winding down, uh, but innovation and research will be gearing up. And so this is really where I see we have this incredible opportunity to display this project on a world stage, and demonstrate those best practices for engaging the community, engaging with youth, engaging with researchers, and really strengthen that reputation that we, we have and are building and developing, um, that reputation as a global center of nuclear expertise. So Canada as a whole, I think, in this, in this space, really has an opportunity to show that we're leaders through the entire life cycle of nuclear generation. So between developing new technology like SMRs and refurbishment and decommissioning, um, we really have that, that ability to tell the story, to share that expertise, to share what we've learned. And you know, we're, we're looking to, to certainly attract some attention on, on best practices um, to learn from others and, and really uh, be able to to champion what we've learned that's great that's great i've got one last question i'm curious what everyone's you know last and big final thought is uh, to, to all the attendees on on this uh on this broadcast right now stick around because in three four minutes gary is going to take us through uh, the next pillar of this strategy very exciting discussion coming up but before we wrap up question for all of you what does maximizing prosperity related to the nuclear sector mean to you? See if you can sum it up in you know two three sentences, and I'll go around the I'll go around the panel and you know what jumps out of you. What what is the maximizing prosperity opportunity for you for Durham? Who wants to go first? Anyone? Put up your hand. And, um, I'll go uh, first. All right, Ron. Let's. Uh, I think the key word is uh, innov innovative ways of decommissioning, in innovative ways of developing new applications for SMRs, innovative ways of producing medical isotopes. This is the chance for the region capitalizing on the Canadian Centre for Nuclear Sustainability that was set up here. Take advantage of your relationship with OCNI, which happens to be located. I'm right here now in beautiful downtown Pickering. Take advantage of those partnerships and become leaders in areas because of what's happening at Pickering with SMRs and with refurbishment. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Kirk, do you want to go next? Any any thoughts? Sure. I'd say the, the key thing is joined up thinking, working together with mutual respect. Because when any of those things doesn't work, we get delay, we don't get progress. So if we listen to each other, we have respect for different opinions on all sides of the argument, which is an, that's an important point. And we work together for collective solutions, innovative solutions, like Ron says, yeah, we can be a powerhouse. That's great. Linkages, collaboration, fantastic. Sheila, I saw you had your hand up there. You want to go next? Yeah. So, hey, I'm glad you said three sentences because I was going to give a really long run on sentence. <laughs> <was only> <laughs> so, you know, I think, I, th I think we're in such, such a wonderful spot here in Durham region uh, when it comes to, uh, to this sector, but 
I would suggest that it's time for us to move on at looking at this as one sector, looking at as community development. It can reach our health care. It can reach our soci social uh, health, the, the, the social fabric of our community can hinge on on how we successfully integrate all of our needs and all of our all of our goals um, from prosperity. Uh, and um, equally uh, saving the environment at the same time and trying to hit those net zero and protecting the land and um, and making sure that all our needs are met. We've got bright minds. We've got a lot of uh, people moving here with OPG's headquarters moving here. A lot of major projects that are being watched globally. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that who we are today is able to take advantage and protect what we have. Completely agree. Katie, last big thought, maximizing prosperity. What does that mean to you for Durham? I think for our community, it would mean uh, meaningful action to support the promises of truth and reconciliation, ensuring protection of the land and its resources, the creation of real economic opportunities for, for Indigenous peoples and eco ec ecological prosperity to benefit our future generations. Couldn't have put it better. That, that's great. Fies? Uh, not much more to add. I'll just go back to um, my, my initial comments and that was let's build on our experience and our reputation and let's build communities together. Uh, I think Sheila hit the nail um, on the head. It's just like, you know, it just really let's work together on this. And um, it's a collaborative effort. It's Pickering. It's not just Pickering and Clarenton. It's Durham region. It's all of our communities. It's our supply chain. Um, and let's collaborate. And let's tell the world who we are. Let's tell our story. I think you're on mute, Simon. Thanks, guys. Sandra, how about you? Maximizing prosperity, what does that mean for Durham? Absolutely, and I'll tell you what, Simon, I'll do it in one sentence and give you a bit of a segue into our next session. Um, so to me, this really is about capitalizing on our strengths and our ability to find ways to accelerate the adoption of cleaner and more sustainable electricity solutions to maximize inclusive prosperity. Sandra, thank you. Ron, Katie, Kirk, Sheila and Fiaz, thank you so much to our panelists for their time today. And for those turning in who sent questions, great questions, either in advance or through the chat. If we didn't get to your questions, you know, it just means we'll have to do this again another time soon. So I'm gonna turn things over for thank our next. Thanks, Ron. Take care. Well, I'll turn things over now to my colleague, Gary Williams, who's gonna introduce the next speaker. Gary? Great, thank you, Sam, Simon, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this next topic, the path to net zero and the role of nuclear in our community. And my name is Gary Williams. Uh, thanks for being with us today. I'm the Director of Communications for the Region of Durham and the Director Lead for Grow Understanding Goal with Inner Nuclear Strategy. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Dan Hornwig. Dan is an Associate Professor and Associate Dean at Ontario Tech University. For almost 20 years, Dan was a, with the World Bank including as lead advisor overseeing sustainable cities and climate change programs. Dan was the chief safety and risk officer for the province of Ontario at Technical Standards and Safety Authority from 2012 to 2020. Dan researches energy and material flow of cities and urban systems. He chairs the region's, Region of Durham's Roundtable on Climate Change and is a juror with the WWF Sustainable Community Award. He is also a board director with Clean Air Partnership and previous, previously with Waste Diversion Ontario. You're a busy man, Dan. Thank you and, and, and welcome and thank you for being with us today. I'm going to turn it over to you now for your presentation and looking forward to our chat. Great. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, everyone. Um, Roger, I'm assuming you're going to advance the slides um, or, or whomever. Um, the next the next slide was going to be a, a cartoon of a skunk at a picnic, but I, I, I kind of left that out. Uh, so maybe go to the next slide, Roger. So I just wanted to maybe take a step back on where we are and where we might be headed on this, this road to net zero. 
And yes, I know all politics is local, but usually local politics is, is either uh, responding to or contributing to global trends. And I think these are the four biggies. Um, and just having listened to the, the talk before, I would add a fifth. Anyways, urbanization is a big honking deal. It's where all of the energy is going around the world, almost 80%. All of the stuff that's being dug out of the ground and shipped around ends up going to rich people in cities. Cities make us rich and then cities want energy and material. And we just, um, in 2008, we reached the, the midway point of half of the world being urbanized. And now we're seeing what the response of Asia urbanizing is and we still have Africa to go. Demographics is the other big one. This is when, when our parents were Canadians and, and we were developing things like, uh, well, our grandparents, I guess, the United Nations and that sort of thing, Canada's relative share of the global economy was three times what it is today, and it's declining fast. So we're used to thinking the rich countries are in the OECD, but our students graduating today, 80% of the, um, of the wealth to be generated for the rest of this century will be outside of OECD, sort of the rich country clubs like us. Then we have the digital economy and climate change is, is the fourth, I think, big global trend. The fifth one I would say is that we're getting additional new um, powerful voices um, and, 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 and high time we are. Indigenous voices around the world, Black Lives Matter, uh, low income countries, we're getting a lot more input into the dialogue. Um, so what we have is the emergence of wicked problems. Next slide, Roger. And so next slide. And next slide. We like to blame sort of wicked problems on, you know, one bad person, maybe it's Donald Trump or, or whomever, but uh, next slide. It's re and next slide. Wicked problems really are a function of, of us. Humans, when we interact, we cause enormous problems from uh, things like a strike at Ontario Tech University to a war in Russia is just how difficult it is for people to get along and focus on the priorities as opposed to all sorts of things that, that affect us. Next slide. Now, just take a second to maybe to maybe you know, talk about COVID and how it really is a dress rehearsal for climate change. Uh, next slide. So let's just take us, you know, what are the emerging lessons from COVID? Well, one is that we got enormous geopolitical problems. China fights with the US, we blame China, it goes on and on. Here in Canada, our federation arguably was not up to the task. Um, we, we did see some amazing progress on things like uh, MR, mRNA uh, vaccines and how fast they were introduced, just staggering the, the, the progress there. Um, we see again and again and again that much of the heavy lifting of government services falls to the cities. We see that in, in Ottawa right now with the blockade. Um, and we're also seeing this intensification of insiders and outsiders. And, whether it's anti-vaxxers today or, or something else, we have to figure out how to get along with a part of our society that is just um, not happy. Um, next slide. The other big issue, I don't know how many of you are, are liberals. Well, actually I probably could guess because Durham is one of the places that's, that's unique in that it's split. But I think this is important. It's just reflective that 80% of the current government in Ottawa got their seats from just four cities. So we have a really polarized country and things are getting worse. And this is, it's not just Canada, this is around the world. If you did the same thing for Democrat, Republican states, you would say, see the same thing, Brazil, Brexit, on and on and on. We have a really fractious, fractious? We have a, a, a People are taking sides and they're not being nearly as civil as they should be to get us out of this mess. Next slide. So um, COVID, is, COVID is like a baby dress rehearsal for climate change. Climate change is huge. Next slide. And I, I just, I just want to emphasize that point. This is a great slide from, from Caesar, uh, the, the group out in the University of, of Alberta. And Canada is, we have the dubious distinction of being one of the first countries to fail in terms of uh, the Kyoto Protocol. Then we failed in our com 
Copenhagen commitments. Uh, and those there, those the two little yellow dots are Paris commitments. Today, Canada is about the highest per capita. And I think this is the correct way to measure greenhouse gas emissions, by the way, it's per capita. It's what we as individuals within our cities and our country are responsible for. Um, this is where we are today, 22 tons roughly. And by 2050, we have a law in Ottawa, a federal law that says we will be net zero, basically less than three tons. This is Herculean. This has never been attempted uh, in the history of the, of the world. And I just, the scale of the task ahead of us is so enormous. Next slide. And what complicates this? Now, this is an old slide. Um, and you can tell that it's old because Canada is actually lower than the United States on these greenhouse, on this chart. And it's actually Canada has, has, has moved ahead of the US and we're, we're world-class carbon and solid waste and water using um, people in the world. Um, and it's all kind of related. The point I wanted to make on this slide was those three um, parts of the pie are roughly equal populations. Um, actually, they're not the, the smallest. The two and a half percent represents three billion people in the world. So just look over way on the right hand side. You see Ethiopia, Tanzania, Bangladesh. Next slide. So this is this is you know, I, I just love this picture and I, I keep using it, but it's 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 just so uh, iconic for me. So this is Betu. Betu is, this picture was taken two years ago. He's, he was 13 in the picture. He's a kid who was taken out of school. He and his eight-year-old sister were both taken out of school in um, Bera, Mozambique, second largest country or city in Mozambique, to sell oranges because his family has no money. He makes roughly 40 cents a day selling those oranges. Um, and that was enough to take him out of school. And all he got from Ontario basically was a hand-me-down t-shirt from the Union Pearson Express that somebody threw out. Um, and I don't know if you've heard, you remember, but Barra was in the news, the city, twice actually. Once in 2019 was the largest cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere, completely destroyed the town of, of um, uh, Barra. And then again, the hundred, the second hundred year storm, three years later, nailed the city again. And the issue that we have to think about with regard to climate change, because it is going to manifest in political challenges and noise and anger, is that this, you know, there are 600 million Betus today in the world who are being taken out of school um, because they don't have any money. They have done nothing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, and they are getting hit the hardest from climate change. And they are going to get angrier and angrier, and I think they have every right to be angry. And we need to think about, as Canadians um, and as people in Durham, how we respond to this. Next slide. So this is just another way of showing the, the Herculean task that we have ahead of us. You can see Toronto. Toronto there includes Durham. Um, it's the GTHA that is represented there as Toronto. By 2050, we need to get all of those are the 100 largest cities in the world. We need to get them all in that bottom right hand uh, rectangle where we don't have a single city yet today. And each one of those cities to get them to this um, low carbon strategy is, is more difficult than, than sending you know, people to the moon, for example. Um, next slide. So I show this at my peril, perhaps. Um, <laughs> this was uh, my first introduction to climate change in Durham region. Um, when I was working at the World Bank, we published a paper. Nobody reads any. I mean, professors love to pretend that people read their papers, but they don't. Um, but this one got picked up um, because it actually had a statement tucked away in somewhere about rating and ranking cities. And we had this amazing data from the University of Toronto that showed, next slide, that for residential emissions, we have three, three neighborhoods, one in Whitby, one in East York, and one in um, Etobicoke, 
And Whitby, just the residential greenhouse gas emissions alone were 13 tons per capita, whereas in East York, they were an order of magnitude less, roughly the same amount of money, same city, same urban region. But because the houses were big and everybody commutes in Whitby, it had the dubious distinction of being the highest um, neighborhood in, in the GTA. And it made the front page of the Toronto Star. And of course, the mayor of Whitby, Pat Perkins, was not very happy. Um, my my lovely, not, I don't, what, my now wife uh, was the communications head at uh, OPG, got all sorts of phone calls. Hey, who's the idiot who wrote this paper at the World Bank? Kind of has a similar name. Um, and what happened was that people really started to see how where next slide how it really matters where you live um what you buy matters but where you live matters more and um, next slide and one of the big things from durham that we have relatively low emissions from certain things is that transportation emissions are huge as are um the emissions to heat our homes next slide okay so this is um, from TAF, which is probably the best greenhouse gas emissions inventory for, for the region right now. Next slide. And this is what our emissions are. Again, this is a bit tricky because you look at it, you say, wow, look at Toronto 13.1 compared to Durham at 5.1. That doesn't factor in population. So next slide. So this is Durham's emissions by sector. Again, this is a bit tricky because we really should have real-time greenhouse gas emissions because something this big of a challenge really requires, I would argue, better metrics and more timely metrics. But you can see here that it's our transportation emissions in Durham that are biggies. Um, industry is a biggie too, um, especially you know, things like the, the um, St. Mary's cement as well as buildings, which is mostly heating buildings. Um, uh, next slide. And we have, you heard that Durham, um, we have um, declared states of uh, climate emergencies and we have net zero targets. This is Durham's uh, energy plan to get to a low carbon pathway. And you can see the big chunks that have to come down are transportation and residential emissions. Uh, next slide. But. This is where I kind of feel like the skunk at the picnic. Um, nuclear energy really is a scope one uh, greenhouse gas emission. And I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this because even my eyes glaze over at the scope one, two, three. And now there's even a scope four, which is all these people who are declaring net zero emissions. So scope four would be trying to offset your emissions. But you can see that it's really quite complicated and difficult to to or easy to be less than fulsome with your with your um, targets and objectives next slide so this this came out just last week and I think it's really useful to to just spend a second on it so somebody took the time to look at the 25 pretty well the 25 best companies in the world sadly none none were Canadian on what they were saying is, hey, look, at, we're net zero. Here's our targets. We're going to be, you know, low carbon. And they they sort of checked under the hood and did the math and found out that all but basically one or two of them was obfuscating and not being very forthright and fulsome with how they were going to get to net zero. And the, the challenge for net zero really is this scope three. The other stuff that so we may have only our transportation and our energy emissions, but you know if we're buying hamburgers from 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 forests in Brazil, that has a huge impact. Or if we're flying every three weeks to Hawaii, another big impact. Um, so this is kind of the warning I think last week for corporations, and I would not be surprised if we start seeing it for municipalities, countries, provinces as well that somebody's going to say, hey, wait a second, the path doesn't look that realistic and that easy. Next slide. Now, I just wanted to take, of course, a second on why net zero needs nuclear. And without a doubt, net zero in Ontario definitely needs nuclear. 
We're going to take a massive body blow when Pickering closes because that's going to increase everyone in Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions by about one and a half to two tons per year. Big, big impact. Um, nuclear has really done the heavy lifting of getting us um, to net zero or to lower carbon emissions in Ontario. Um, but you can see, so Bruce Power has a net zero target, a corporate target of being net zero by 2027, OPG by 2040. Somebody is going to start asking questions about how are you going to get there? What does that mean? How does that fit into the province? These sorts of things. Next um, slide. Okay, so I, and again, sorry Durham, but 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 the world sees Durham as part of the Toronto region. Um, and and I actually think that's a really good thing. Durham is, you know, um, you know, we like we often hear you know the Clarington is where the sun rises in Toronto kind of thing. And I I think Durham is the place where there's still a chance uh, opportunity to do a lot of these things that we know that need to be done. Um, next slide. And to get us to net zero. Arguably, it's a three. It's a three-trip pony, I guess. Priority one is transportation, and it isn't only getting electric vehicles. Um, it will be ride sharing. It will be tolls. It will be integrated transit. We need all of that. It will be hydrogen for heavy-duty trucks. We need that, and we need it now. Um, next slide. Again, you can tell this is I have old slides because I don't think you can buy a house in Oshawa anymore for six hundred thousand dollars. And I think this might be a year old or who knows or two. Anyways, so the next biggie is that we cannot use natural gas to heat all of our homes any longer. We should be having programs in place where we have heat pumps, etc. Huge, huge emissions are coming from our buildings, most of it from heating. And next slide. And then this is the biggie that I think we're all um, excited about. And I think we really should be proud as Ontarians because Ontario has done a lot of the heavy lifting um, in getting out of, of coal. Um, we need to have a low carbon electricity um, grid, which we have, but we're probably going to increase our electricity grid by 40 to 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour when Pickering closes, because it will be replaced by gas. Um, we should be making a statement that we we make will make every effort to keep our electricity below 50 grams. Um, some say that below 100 grams is clean, um, and we we peaked we had 110 grams just um, in January because we were generating a lot of electricity because of the cold. Anyways, we have some. And, and you know, the SMR in, in Darlington will not go very far to replace what we're losing at Pickering. So as we have this big rush to electrify, our carbon intensity of our electricity is increasing. So we have a big challenge. OK, our last two slides and then maybe we have hopefully some time for questions. So I want to just take a really quick this whole devil in the detail of scope. So Darlington is ah, I love Darlington nuclear power plant. It is such a heavy lifter when it comes to scope one, low carbon electricity. Uh, 12 grams is roughly what electricity is. Um, uh, and it, each nuclear power plant, Darlington, Pickering and Bruce, roughly um, reduce about one and a half tons per CO2 um, uh, per person per year um, um, compared to the, to the average grid elsewhere. So, Nuclear got us out of coal. Um, now, scope three is a bit trickier because even something like, I just did a quick calculation, people driving to Darlington just to go to work generate about 30,000 tons of CO2 per year just for employee vehicles. Um, that's about a thousand households. Um, you know, there's a quick and easy place to start to, to, to go after some of these scope three and triple that for construction activities. Okay, last slide. So just to sum up sort of what I think is the nuclear power and the road to, to, to net zero, or let's just call it low carbon, because net zero is with a scope four is pretty tricky, but 
Nuclear has made it possible for Ontario to get out of coal, and it's the single largest uh, carbon mitigation project in North America, um, and that is a wonderful thing. We still, however, have a very long way to go. The fact that Canada is at 22 tons of CO2 per person when we have one of the lowest carbon electricity grids in the world should give everyone concern because we're doing well in electricity, but we're generating a lot elsewhere. Um, nuclear and renewables are not net zero, they emit. Um, we really need these honest and fulsome metrics. Um, and last point, you know, nuclear is, uh, is, a, is a really interesting place to work because you see how divisive and, and, and challenging it can be with the public. And we really have to stop fighting with each other, whether nuclear is better than wind or better than solar or better than this or better than that. And we have to start fighting greenhouse gas emissions. There is no way we will come anywhere close to the task at hand in terms of lowering greenhouse gas emissions without real concerted effort of working together to get there. And I, I think that that may be one of the greatest strengths that nuclear may be able to provide is to get people thinking about how we need to work together. Um, so, and I would love to, um, last slide, um, answer any questions if, there, if we have time. That's great. Thank you very much, Dan, for the presentation. Great presentation. We do have time for a couple questions. I'm gonna throw the first one out there because there's a lot of things that stood out to me in this presentation. One of the comments that you made was climate change dwarfs COVID-19, which and COVID-19 is kind of a dress rehearsal for climate change, which is quite a statement as all of us have gone through for the last few years, COVID-19. Do you, and I know what a dress rehearsal is, is trying to make you better for the actual performance. So do you feel that we've learned anything? Do you, do you have any confidence from your perspective that we've learned anything through this dress rehearsal to tackle climate change? Oh yeah, I think we've learned a lot. I think we've learned to be afraid. I guess <laughs> that may not be so good. Um, but I think we've we're starting to learn. Like if we have to declare a you know the Emergencies Act for the first time ever for COVID, we know that you know that that we would need it hundreds of times for some of the arguments that are going to happen in in climate change whether it's Ontario versus Alberta, or how much more gas we can use, or when do you phase out, or should your net zero targets be 2027 or 2040? All these things are have the potential to be really visceral, angry, and nasty. And I think we have, and I think it starts at the local government. That's where I think Durham is, is particularly well served. Like you have, you know, Mayor Ryan and, we have we have people who are will, who are willing and able to talk to the community, and I think we're going to have to be much more forthright with the community on things the community doesn't like. So Ontario is a classic example where I've never seen more angry discussion about the price of electricity. Well, the price of electricity in Ontario is still half of what it is in Europe, but it is the thing that gets people kicked out of office faster than anything in Ontario. We're going to need some adult conversations about some of the tasks at hand. And I think we, perhaps in the academic community, need to provide some, some, some um, cover fire or some help to the politicians, to the municipalities that, you know, sorry, there's no way around this. These are the tough questions that we need to, it's kind of like we're gonna have to start eating our vegetables. Um, and that needs to come from more than just a few out there politicians who know they're not gonna run again. Great, thanks for that, Dan. So I'm gonna try to squeeze in one or two more. Uh, this is from our chat box. So from sustainability and ec ecological perspective, is nuclear power generally clean energy or a renewable, renewable resource? While it may not emit GHG, does it still not produce radioactive waste? And I, I would really be interested in the answer to this one. Ooh, great question. So we have a course at uh, from Ontario Tech on the future role of nuclear that spends a whole course on this. So, and even then the students at the end of the course still don't, you know, still have to debate yes or no. I would argue yes, but I would argue, you know, it's kind of like there's no free lunch, that, that nothing is perfect Nuclear is not perfect, wind is not perfect, solar is not perfect, hydro is not perfect. The first the time that I kind of started taking notice of environmental issues was the whole James Bay 
um, hydroelectric project, which just flooded massive areas. Um, so hydro is not perfect either. Um, but having said all of that, you know, we spend a lot more time talking about whether it should be nuclear, whether it should be solar, whether it should be wind than we do on conservation, for example. We are terrible at conservation. We use more electricity per person than just about anyone in the world. And yet, if you say anything about conservation, it doesn't, you know, you're not really there. So um, I'm not sure if that's a cop out, but I would argue that nuclear, all things considered, nuclear is as good a form of electricity generation as anything um, that it's being compared to. And it's significantly better than coal and probably gas as well. And I'll, you know, free, free, whoever asked the question, you can have a free, free enrollment to the course if you want. Wow, that's quite the offer. Yeah. Okay, so whoever posted that, there you go. Uh, thank you very much for this, Dan. This is a, a, an incredible conversation. I wish we had more time to continue it, but we're running up to the end of the, uh, the session. So thank you for your time. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Sandra Austin, Director of Strategic Initiatives, to offer some closing remarks. Sandra, over to you. Thanks very much, Gary, and thank you to Dr. Hornwig. Um, our collective climate actions absolutely have to be our top priority. And thanks for that reference. I certainly watched OPG's video a couple of days ago showing the successful implosion of the Lambton generating station with such awe. And that closure of coal really remains one of the world's single largest climate change actions. And, and that's really what we need, big, bold, brave actions for decarbonization. So today has been such an exciting day. As a nuclear community for more than four decades, Durham Region has developed significant expertise in energy policy, in the nuclear regulatory process, and also in community health and safety. And so as our speakers and panelists can attest, the nuclear sector benefits from rich collaboration that has facilitated some incredible innovations and partnerships. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for your participation today. Anyone watching is welcome to reach out to our team at any time at nuclearstrategy.durham.ca. I certainly want to take a quick moment to thank Samiksha Diandrel, Sangeeta Pabla, Gary Williams, Joanne Paquette, Shannon Keller, Laura Stefan for coordinating today's event, and also to Christine Drimmy, who's enjoying her recent retirement, and Caitlin Rochon for their knowledge, expertise, and guidance in developing and leading this strategy. And finally, thank you to all of you for participating. We hope that the information was insightful and informative. You will all receive a follow-up email with a link to the strategy that you may share. And we also invite you to take a moment to complete a short questionnaire that'll help us plan for future sessions. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, everyone. Thank you, miigwech, and goodbye.